So, uh, if you haven't figured it out already, I'm Linda. It's easy to tell. Um, we decided that I'm old, and Brandon is pretty, and Patrick is cute. So, <laughs> as you can see, um, we're good friends. We've been working together, Brandon and I, for a couple of years, and Patrick and I for a year, uh, and a really special project in Minnesota. I understand I wasn't at the session last night, but I understand they missed Minnesota in the roll call, so we should probably sing Ra 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 for Skyuma or something. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I want to welcome you and tell you that the next hour and a half we're going to spend together to help you vision and move forward toward such a simple objective that I didn't even put it on the objectives. It is simply to work toward creating a normal dining experience for the folks who dine with you every day at home. If you're still traditional, it's probably not a normal dining experience. If you're the other end of the spectrum and you're in households, it probably is. We have an extremely mixed group and we know that. So, whoops, they just shut me off. Do you think that was a <laughs> So our objectives, as stated, are to um, talk a little bit about the new dining practice standards and how they support our work. Uh, to look at opportunities for enhancing our residents' dining experience and to look at opportunities for transforming the back of the house kitchen from institutional to home. So I'm the front of the house person. Patrick is the back of the house person. We meet in the dining room because we both play a key role there. And Patrick, or Brandon, is responsible for bringing us all together. So. I'm gonna now turn it over to Brandon. Thank you, Linda. It's great to be here in Denver. I lived in Colorado for 10 years before moving back to Minnesota. So uh, it's kind of nice to be home. I'm actually gonna be going back to Minnesota with my daughter and two grandkids in a van. We might end up by a river. I don't know by the time it's over with, but it should be a fun trip for us. So just a little bit about uh, me. My name is Brandon Peach and um, I've been in senior services, healthcare administration for uh, the past 35 years in Minnesota and in Colorado. And um, I've, throughout my career, I've truly had a um, personal and professional passion for uh, person-centered care, for resident-centered care, uh, as we work in senior housing and in nursing home settings. And um, in the different organizations that I've been a part of, um, as you all know, there's so many different ways of getting to uh, providing that type of care for the people that we're serving. And so today, um, we want to share with you just one example of how we're approaching that. And um, as I mentioned last night in the uh, welcome session, you know, think about ways that you can challenge yourselves, how you can challenge us in terms of uh, how we're looking at things and hopefully make things better for the people that we're serving as we go forward. So a little bit of um, background um, as far as how our approach has been developed. Um, Centric Care Health System is a central Minnesota, primarily hospital-based organization. Uh, we have clinics, hospitals, um, senior housing, uh, nursing facilities, and it's truly an organization that has come together, um, while there's a long history, over 125 years of history with our uh, main campus, uh, we've had several affiliates that have joined our system over the last five to seven years. And as that's happened, it's, it's given a much stronger presence for senior services within our system. So we've been trying to move away from a more institutional model into becoming more um, resident-centered in how we're providing services to those people that we're working with. Uh, one of the opportunities that we have in Minnesota, and I think each state approaches quality initiatives differently, uh, Minnesota has two programs. One is called the PIP, it's a Performance Incentive Payment Program, and uh, we also have what's called a QIP, and it's a Quality Improvement. Every facility in our state can participate in a QIP. And basically, you receive a rate enhancement for being uh, part of that um, 
program. As far as the PIP goes, it's a competitive process. And what we've done is we actually have received two uh, PIP awards over the last two years with regard to person-centered care. And so for the last two years, we've been working with Action Pact and um, moving our seven uh, long-term care facilities towards person-centered care. Uh, this past year, in an effort to try to enhance our dining experience, we put in an application um, to do that, and we were also awarded that. So um, in helping work towards our system integration, what um, I looked at and what I uh, wanted to do with this dining PIP was really try to figure out how we can enhance that dining experience by supporting what happens in the back of the our house, what happens in the kitchen, what happens with our production staff, and then also work with what happens in the dining room. And then along the way, what are the things that we need to really make a more home-like environment, um, make a more person-centered approach to our dining services are, are handled? So are there equipment things that we need? Um, can we purchase new uh, you know, tableware, smallwares, those kinds of things that can help enhance that experience? So. Those are the, the things that we've been focusing on with that, with um, the current PIP, and Linda and Patrick are gonna um, explain their pieces to that as we move forward. Um, so when we look at the back of house side, and that's where uh, Patrick comes in, we, we were really trying to figure out how do we support our nutrition services staff in providing them training, support, guidance. Uh, a lot of organizations, senior care organizations, the additional support and training that, that, that those staff receive is typically the mandatory education. Um, we haven't really in the past spent a lot of effort or energy on how do we build those culinary skills. Um, and that just comes from um, being so traditional in, in our history within our organization. Um, so that's something in the last couple of years that I've been part of the organization that I wanted to bring um, to, to Centric Care. The front of house side with uh, Linda and with Action Pact that we've been focusing on, um, we call it at your service, and it's really taking the Action Pact person-centered principles and um, applying them to how we want that, that um, dining experience to be personalized for each of our, our residents as they um, are part of that dining time. So with that, um, I'm going to let Linda and Patrick um, talk about some of the ways that they come, to, come together and, um, and bring together what happens on the back of um, the house and with what happens with what Linda's work is doing with our staff on the dining room side. So Linda? So not surprising, I want to add a couple of words to what Brendan said. Wouldn't you love to have a CEO who was foresightful enough to write a grant where you could bring all your staff together, working together in the dining experience, where you could bring a chef extraordinaire working in the kitchen side by side with your cooks, those same little old ladies who've been cooking in the kitchen for 20 years and, you know, we don't know if they really are up to it or not. And then, furthermore, he put in money for refurbishing the entire dining room, new equipment, new de dishes, tablewares, um, but also chairs, de decor, the whole nine yards. So I'm just really appreciative of your ability to pull it all together and thankful to the state of Minnesota for being willing to fund such a project. So it would help us a little bit to know a little bit more about you. We know we have a huge mix because we pulled your, we pulled your signups if you signed up to attend. Um, but I'd be real curious to know how many of you are working in a household environment right now where you have full kitchens 
and you're able to cook breakfast to order from scratch. So we have about four or five people. And, and so that is kind of the one, the one end of the spectrum. At this point in time, it's kind of the vision, although I'm sure in another 10 years, it'll be, it'll be moved even further in that direction, especially when the boomers take over with our vision of households and transform it to theirs. Uh, we'll probably have a fast food restaurants in every, in every cafe, in every, everybody will have a bistro with a variety of fast foods and be open 24 seven. Um, what about, is anybody still pretty traditional? Anyone still doing tray service from a main kitchen? Just, just one or two, one, two, three? Okay, yeah, so you have, you have several. Okay, you do. Okay, you know it's really interesting. Um, I'm I'm old, as you can see, um, and it's amazing to see how that number change has changed during the progression of the Pioneer Network. The first time I ever spoke at the first Pioneer Network gathering, probably 80% of the room was still tray service for at least part of their building, and not all. 80% of the room has moved kind of in another direction. So it's really fun to see that change. Um, as a dietitian in my first life, it really warms my heart uh, because I believe then and continue to believe now that those of you sitting in the room are the most important focus of the transformation from institution to resident directed life at home. And I boldly say, if we get dining right, we can muck up a whole lot of the rest of it because food is so incredibly important to everyone. Um, it really does define a good life. So believing that not many of you would have printed out your PowerPoint, um, I did make copies for you, or I didn't, the wonderful action-packed crew did. Uh, so if you look at your, your handout pages, I'm gonna talk quickly through the first few pages, then I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick to do some talking about how he worked with the back of the house folk and how we met in the dining room. And then at the end, we'll come together and kind of talk about principles of resident-directed dining as a team. So if you look at page two, it's Action Pack's typical uh, description of household life. And I think the first three uh, descriptors of the household, even though we at Action Pact build environments to make it possible, they're really available to everyone, no matter how traditional your environment is. And that is the opportunity to create a sense of home for the residents that is their home and their sanctuary. Now, if you haven't had the luxury of environmental changes, home might still be defined as sharing a room with somebody, so it might be just your little portion of the room. But the more we do with nooks and crannies and common spaces and creating just that sense of comfort, um, the people who live here direct their own lives individually and collectively. That's open to everybody and it's on us to change our systems to support that. So that's what we hope to really uh, share with you as we take a look at the facilities that we're working with to transform. Um, one of them started completely on tray service and they've now gone to point of service choice with kind of jerry-rigged, band-aided approaches till we get the architects together and get some construction done. They can't create home right now uh, because they will be working on bigger projects in the future, but they're able to create a dining experience where the residents can direct their own lives individually and collectively, even though they're still totally traditional in their organizational design and their physical environment. And the third one, the boundaries of the person are clear and respected as a matter of course. So if we really kind of focus on those, and I don't want to talk a lot about the new dining practice standards because I hope you've all read them. I guess I would dare to ask, how many of you have incorporated the new dining practice standards into your life? Ooh, that's not a large number. Um, so do you all know where to find them? Go on the Pioneer Network website. 
um, the standards are there. There's a toolkit available for purchase from the Pioneer Network for $200 that just jump starts you on the implementation of them. And I, they were written in 2010, and I believe were the, the kind of precursors to the new mega rule. The um, recommended practices for the new dining practice standards all default, all decisions default to the resident. So they totally were written to help us guide our dining thinking toward honoring resident choice. So if you haven't um, taken a look at them, they're really um, a ma masterful document because if you in fact adopt them, and your policies and procedures reflect that you have adopted and you follow the guidance and the recommendations, you basically have a firm footing during regulatory processes or um, complaint investigations or ombudsman visits. There's, there's something you can work from together to uh, move forward in a positive direction. So what's this all about, this creating normal? Um, if you think about your own personal relationship with food. We all control everything that we put in our mouth from the minute we move out of our parents' home <laughs> until we move into our nursing homes. And if you're still a traditional nursing home, your dietary leaders meet you and greet you and tell you um, this is when you eat. This is our menu, we have two choices, and if you don't like the choices, you can get usually something simple extra. Um, this is when our snack cart comes around, this is what's on our snack cart. And I would challenge you that for most of the folks who move in, that is not normal. That is, in fact, their first introduction to institutionalized dining. So basically what we want to do is transform so that we simply, when our residents move in, we ask, how did you dine at home? What did, what did you do? What do you like? When? Who with? Where? And then form a plan to help you continue to do that, living with us in our institution. So page number three is just a quick summary. It's all about choice, and I, my, my uh, approach to choice is that we have been compliant with choice uh, for, how many years is it since 1987 when Ober came out? 40? But it was token choice. Do you want the chicken or the fish? Uh, gee, I don't want either. So that to me is token choice, it's meaningless choice. The true choice, which is what I hope you all go away with a sense of today, is having access, accessibility 24-7 to the foods and beverages that give me personal daily pleasure and enjoying it all in a relationship-based environment. So this is our recommendation for that how-to approach of how to enhance resident-directed dining at home. So just to experience it a little bit, I'd like you to take um, just a, about three or four minutes and take a look at the uh, exercise, which is on page four. It's, it's also the focus of your takeaway from today. And I don't know, I thought that the Pioneer Network was printing takeaway uh, sheets, but I don't see them in the room, so are, are they available? Do you know, Diane, are they available for download on the, where do people find them to download? On the app. Oh, the infamous app. I should probably download that, shouldn't I? I'm still learning to use my cell phone, so I don't do apps real well, especially since I can't remember my Apple password, so I can't get in to download anything on the apps at the moment. Uh, so the, the take, out, take home that we provided is this concept of daily pleasures, because this is really where it all starts. So this is a very formal interview process. I don't want to go through it. Hopefully, it'll be helpful to you to, as, a, as a takeaway. What I'd like you to do is talk to your neighbor. If you have four people at your table, talk in twosies. If you have three people at your table, talk together. I want you to share with each other what is 
a daily pleasure of yours related to food, something that you just need to get the day going right. You need to feel good. You need to feel fulfilled. Or you can't wait till you get home from work and you can enjoy it. And just to get you started, Patrick and I had a little daily pleasure conversation this morning that he didn't realize was a daily pleasure conversation, but he will now, um, because I was looking for a cup of coffee, which seemed like a relatively simple feat um, until I tried to find one. And so I shared with Patrick that I'm really picky about my coffee, and not only the coffee, but I need to have about a third of it be milk, not cream, not creamer, just plain old milk. I don't care. I mean, my preference is 2%, but I'll take whole or 1%, even skim in a pinch. Patrick drinks it straight up black. He's a, so I guess we're black and white as well as, be, as being old and cute. <laughs> um, so it's just those things that you know, we don't even think about. A cup of coffee isn't just a cup of coffee. So take just a couple minutes, share with your neighbor your personal daily pleasure related to food. What makes it a good day? If I have this, it's good. If I don't, eh, maybe tomorrow. And then I'm gonna ask you to share. So you gotta do it. Okay, it's getting a little bit quiet. So. Um, Tell me your daily pleasure related to food or rat on your neighbor. What's a daily pleasure? Coffee for everyone at the table. Good coffee. How do you define good coffee? Brewed coffee, starting with be beans. Any bean drinkers? Yeah. Do you have one of those pots now where you can do it the night before and you put your beans in and then it grinds them in the morning and then you wake up to the noise? You used to just wake up to the smell, but now you can wake up to the noise. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So, um, and when do you get, when do you enjoy that first cup? Five, ten. Whoa. So, and not to get too personal, but before what and after what? First minute my feet hit the floor before I even go to the bathroom? You do, okay. And then that's your second stop. Okay, so if you moved in to, are you, are you in an organization? You're working in, in an organization? If you moved in there today, when would you get your first cup of coffee? Okay, and it is brewed. Kudos. Kudos, all down the hall, kudos. So unfortunately, that's not the normal response that I get. What I usually hear is, well, we get it when we come to the dining room for breakfast and the dining room opens and it's about 7.30. And since there's probably no Dow Ebert rep in the room, I can say it often comes from a liquid coffee machine, which does absolutely nothing to speak to the, it's not about the coffee. I mean, I had a really belligerent Dow Ebert rep in the room once, and he, said, he challenged me to a taste test. And he said, if he took my bean ground brewed coffee and served it to me, in a blind study with his liquid coffee, I would pick the liquid coffee. And I said, I don't care. It's not about the taste of the coffee. It's about the experience. It's about the ritual. The beans were the cheapest. Wow. Yeah. Wow, it was the cheapest, yeah. I suppose if you factored labor in, maybe it would get a little bit worse, but it doesn't matter to me because it just doesn't matter. Right, right, no, no, we are not talking staff. We are talking resident directed life at home. And unfortunately, it is sometimes at the expense of staff convenience. But remember, those of you who are as old as I, anybody else remember the signs on the wall? This is our residence home, we only work here. Remember that movement from several years back? So what's another daily pleasure? Coffee's a common one, that's great, thank you. Another daily pleasure? Yes? 
Hot sauce and condiments. Okay, what do you put it on? <laughs> Pretty much anything. Yeah. So do you have a special kind of hot sauce that you like? One from Burma. Oh, it's called Burma. Oh, I'm like, oh my God, I wonder how they're going to get that one, Patrick. <laughs> One from Burma. And um, so is it in a jar or a bottle? It's not in a little packet with an end that you rip off and you can't get open and then you squish it out? So this is a risky question because she's from Schlegel Villages in Canada, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you moved into your home today, could you get that? Y Yeah. So you're from Canada, so you're exempt from my negative remarks to follow, and I'm going to ask you to bail me out. I have a surveyor in the room whom I've already asked to make sure that I stay in line. Um, it is my belief that under the new rules, when a resident asks for a reasonable something, like salsa, a reasonably priced item, that our organization should be expected to provide that. Is that a fair statement? No. 15 years ago, I've had people walk out of a room like this when I said, I don't drink Sam's Club soda. I'm a Pepsi person. And dietary managers would say to me, well, we don't have Pepsi. We can't get Pepsi. We, we can't get the truckload. We can't afford brand products. So I think our world is changing in a positive direction. So because you're from Canada, you're exempt. But if you're not from Canada, um, for what our residents pay or for what our governments pay for our residents to live with us, take another look. Um, because I think the days of families having to bring it in from home for simple food items are long gone. And for God's sake, don't charge them for it, because that I know will be an issue. I don't know, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be a survey issue if families brought it in, but it will be if you try to charge them. So what's another daily pleasure related to food? Yes, shout it out. Well, in, in many sites that I've been in, we you find those challenges as far as gluten-free and different uh, allergies towards spices and so forth. Um, the way I look at it is, you know, there's capabilities in the back of the house to provide certain things because we have a full kitchen. We have lots of ingredients in there. So it's about the communication to the, you know, the food service director and with your allergies and, you know, I've worked with households that have 13, 15 households and they write lists and they have, you know, their profiles. So if you have allergies to the gluten, to pineapple, to uh, thyme and all that, so there's a lot of capabilities. You know, I, I believe in the liberalized diets and if you make everything fresh within the house, everybody's going to enjoy the flavors that much strong and better, you know, so... So you've got the picture. One of the legs of this three-legged skudul of, of dining pleasure is ha knowing your residents' daily pleasures. And I, I think if the way I read the new rule and all the red lines of everything that's changed, I believe that we are now regulatorily called to know our residents' daily pleasures and make sure that they're provided, not just in dining, but that's kind of the focus of our, of our uh, talk today. So a little hint, if you know the daily pleasures of your staff and your residents, then you're gonna find someone like her who makes sure because good coffee is a daily pleasure of hers, she's already understanding and she's gonna go that extra mile to make sure that the smell does permeate and that first cup of coffee doesn't come to people in the when they come to the dining room. So if you link them up a little bit, and that again, this is all about relationships. It used to be all about tasks. Now it's all about relationships. Questions about the concept? Yes, tell us about X. What do you guys do? Shout it out.
You have award-winning communities. Award-winning. Yes. yes. Right. So um, to think normal, again, it, I, I don't know, you know, in my family, my husband is picky about certain things, not many. I'm picky about a lot of things. I have raised a bunch of grandchildren and now great-grandchildren, and they are extremely picky about lots of things. So use your sense of, my guidance, my recommendation would be use your sense of community to help you, because my guess is if you have a household of 16 people, four of them will care a lot about what kind of coffee they have, and do community circles with them, you know, talk with them. How do we want to do this? Maybe someone has a pot in their room for their very own because it comes flown in from somewhere. Now, there's safety considerations, huge safety considerations to that recommendation. That resident has to be assessed to be safe, and if there's any residents in the household who could wander in and be hurt, you have to address the safety. But there's no regulation that says a resident can have a coffee pot. Hopefully they're not in memory support, but they probably wouldn't remember what kind of coffee they needed to have. Yes. Okay, moving right along because these guys have a lot to say too. Look, take a quick look at page number five and I'm not gonna read it to you nor am I gonna talk to you about all of it. Um, but I do have some buttons that I wanna make sure that I share. Um, we've already talked about token choice versus true, true choice. How many of you are currently serving your meals in courses? Starting with beverage, then going to soup. So about half the group so that's a real big thing for me, is that's a normal way of dining. Um, it's also a very cost-effective way of dining, because if you have good soup, good salad, and good bread, you're going to cut down on those expensive pieces of meat, <laughs> because people are going to be so full from the good soup, the good salad, and the good bread that they're going to ask you for small portions of meat. And so, you know, basically waste pays for choice in any resident-directed dining observation. I wish I was younger and could do a PhD project to prove this. Could you guys do a study to prove that at ACTS, maybe? Everybody always says, give me the evidence-based research. And I don't have any, but I know for a fact when the norm is to throw 25 to 33% of the food that you cook down the garbage disposal and with it, all of the labor that it took to cook it, um, that if you find out what your residents want to eat, you can well afford to give it to them. Um, how many of you have point of service choice for each of the courses? See, the numbers are shrinking a little bit, so we're serving in courses, but we're not using that normal approach. And again, think about normal. It is, what would you like to drink? Could I interest you in an appetizer, a salad, a soup of the day? Our entree menu is, and then for dessert. Those choices are so important. Those of you who have point of service choice. How many of you have a piece of paper between the resident and the food? So do they circle something? Okay, so that's just one of my buttons. Um, it's really hard for people to give up that paper. It's really, really hard, but it's not normal. 
to circle a piece of paper with your choice. It's normal to, again, be in relationship with your server. So the paper is a task. It makes choosing what you want to eat a task. Giving your order to a person is relational. So I would hope that you would take a look at that. Um, the new dining practice standards are reflected in the comments on page number five, and I'll just kind of leave you to read them at your leisure. I want to turn to, does it have a page number? Oh my. Well, it doesn't have a page number. It says journal your thoughts, the way to the heart through dining. It's the next page. I'd like to take a couple of minutes again for you to do a, just a brief reflection exercise. So don't talk to your neighbor. Um, I have so many sisters in the room, I can't. I always say if you talk, I'm going to come around like the nun in your Catholic school. Remember the nuns that slapped your fingers with the rulers 70 years ago? You never did that, Sister Imelda. I know you didn't. But, but I got to be careful with my examples. So no talking. Just visualize your favorite dining experience in real life. What's your dining experience that either you enjoyed the most and you hope you get to do it again, or you do it regularly and you can't wait to do it again? Could be plain, could be fancy, could be really expensive, could be really simple. Just what's a dining experience that makes you feel really, really, really wonderful? And then I want you to take a look at the topics on the left-hand side of the page. Who did you share it with? How were you welcomed? What's the environment like? What was your host or wait person like? What's the conversation like? What's the food like? What's the pace of the meal like? And out of that list, pick two or three things that are the reasons that make it be your favorite dining experience. So take about three minutes. Visualize, remember, reflect your favorite dining experience. Look down the list and just put a little mark by why did you pick that? And then I'm going to ask you to share. Okay, let's come together. So, first of all, would a couple of you shout out your favorite dining experiences? What'd you pick? What, what warms your heart as a dining experience? A barbecue with your family. Plain, simple, down home, casual. Are you the cook or do you share? Awesome. Absolutely. And, you know, Disney did write books on the hospitality experience, and they have training courses. People go live there and learn the Disney way. It's one of the respected, really highly valued approaches. The bottom line, though, is exactly what you just said. It's all in the relationships. So even it, your place doesn't sound real fancy, right? It's real personable. Is it? it it's a yeah. So um, I would just encourage you. Well, first let me ask you, as you reflect on your favorite dining experience, and then get more normal about it, and think about just the way you dine in your life. Would anyone want? any of you want to eat every meal for the rest of your life in your long-term care dining room? I was afraid you might say yes, Jonathan, so okay, thank you. Then I don't have to argue with you in public. Um, and that question and these things to think about are your action plan for transforming your residence dining experience closer to one that you would want to eat in for the rest of your life. So I, I have to, I'm a story, story sharer, and I have to share a story, and it's actually from Painesville. It's from Brandon's 
from Brandon's um, organization. So you mentioned barbecuing and you mentioned all the fresh stuff from the garden, you know, coming in and just putting it on the grill and cooking it up. So that's our vision, spontaneous family, welcoming whatever we've got, put it on the grill. So we've been working hard for the last nine months to get more of that kind of spontaneity into the dining service in Brandon's, um, Brandon's long-term care center. And Brandon, actually, Brandon and Patrick both have been working really hard there. You've worked, they've hired a new chef to direct their, their service. And so the last time we were together for a training, um, they very proudly told me that they had scheduled a grill out once every week. Every Tuesday is grill out day. So being rude, that was the first clue that I was hoping that we could get a little bit of spontaneity so that it wasn't an event of having a grill out on Tuesday or a program. So I started kind of teasing them, geez, when do you grill at home? Well, whenever we want, whenever we want. So then I said, what do you serve at the grill out? And they're like, well, one week it's hamburgers, one week it's pork chops, one week it's chicken, and then they, they actually had steak one week. So I'm like, okay, so when you grill at home, when you barbecue, do you sometimes have choices? I mean, I don't know, at my house, we have to have hamburgers and hot dogs because some people won't eat either one. So if we want the meal, and if we have chicken, we always have an alternate. So, you know, just be pushing yourselves a little bit. So great first step, we're having a grill out every week instead of what used to be like once a summer or something like that. Now we're doing it every week. So then start thinking about, well, how can we mix it up a little bit? You know, could we have... Um, I tried to get him to do all four choices at the same time, but he told me that wasn't possible. So I just want you to think about that concept of normal. Think about what you thought about in your favorite dining experience and then use the guides on, on the sheet to be moving in that direction. And think about that really, to me, incredibly foundational question do I want to eat every meal for the rest of my life in this dining room? And what would it take for me to want to do that? Interesting. Exactly. You know, you just hit on one of my buttons, too, and, and it is that statement, we do it in independent living. If you're part of a campus-wide organization and you do it in independent living and you don't do it in long-term care, just think of me and know I'm right on your back. <laughs> With that, I'll pass it over to Pat. Um, you know, one of the questions that Linda challenged you folks with is, you know, with the residents eating in their dining room every day and for the rest of their life. So one of the challenges I challenge you folks to is eating with the residents once with their and seeing how the food actually comes out of your back of the house, uh, out of your kitchen, and how it's presented to them. The other day I was working at uh, Melrose and we did just a simple sweet and sour chicken. and. Then we, you know, added a couple of little pieces. It was how we presented it and how we made the meal and the sauce. So instead of just serving it with the scoop of rice, the 
uh, oriental stir-fried vegetables and the rice, I mean the sweet and sour chicken, we actually made a pool with the rice, put the sweet and sour sauce, and then we actually added a little extra touch to it by putting some sliced green onions on top to create a, you know, the wall effect. But then we also added a cream puff to it and also a miniature vegetarian egg roll. So it completes the meal versus, gee, I'm gonna just serve a traditional no height on the plate. You know, people look at how you present something. So, um, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, thank, and thank Linda and Brandon for inviting me to come to the, the conference with you guys to share stories and stuff. And I am a story type person, but to give you a little bit of background on myself, I've been in the food industry for about 40 years. I'm one of those individuals that did apprenticeships throughout the years, worked my way up to be a corporate uh, chef to a corporate culinary director. And how I met Brandon was that he was looking, like he shared with you, is a vision to help move the, support the kitchen to move it forward to meet Linda in the middle. And some of the things that our company focuses on is basic uh, fundamentals, skill building. And the biggest thing what you, besides doing those fundamentals, is you build confidence, you build morale. When somebody enjoys what they do and has passionate about what they, you know, created and the flavors, just like what, you know, you're a chef, you create flavors, correct? It's all about flavors. It's all about technique to be able to <clears throat> create this liberalized diet because what you're doing is you're searing, you're sweating down the vegetables, you're making the soup, you're, you're able to give a, a low sodium product but with just blossom of flavors. So when I talk about stories and I talked about the sweet and sour chicken. The other day I was at another location which was at the same location but we made homemade meatballs. We didn't use you know soy based meatballs. We actually had some ground sausage in there. We had hamburger in there. We actually scooped them. But the neat thing was we made a, a mushroom sauce that was low sodium. We didn't add any salt to, to the mixture. So everybody in the whole building, because we stewed the meatballs, and they just were able to, the mechanical altered people can eat them because they're super tender. So we took the time, we made the meatballs the day before, we made the sauce, we stewed them. And as well as you know, as you stew something, they become tender more and more and more. So the great thing was, is everybody in the whole building, we didn't have to you know, with the uh, heart healthy, with the low sodium, we didn't have to worry about any of that. We were able to give everybody the same pleasure. As I've been working with uh, center care hospitals and long-term care, we've done special events where we created this relationship and, you know, events to different things like Valentine's Day. I had this one lady said to me, she had a $20 meal. And what we did was we had a great salad. We had a grilled salmon filet with, uh, uh, I believe we had roasted potatoes, uh, a nice vegetable. And then we made a red velvet cake with a raspberry sauce, nice cream cheese, frosting. But she savored every piece of it. And when I did some table touching, she looked at me and said, wow, this was a $20 meal. In fact, it probably was more, but the point of it is she enjoyed and took every piece of that meal and every little piece, the plate was cleaned up. So and Patrick, Brandon's so quiet, he won't say that, but a cheery response to that was so cute. She maybe hasn't been out to a restaurant in quite a while. It's like a $40 meal today. <laughs> In, in when you think of the, the different challenges and taking chances and 
you know, empowering your staff. So I go through, I go to tons of kitchens. You know, I'm pretty comfortable walking in anywhere and saying, what are you making today? I'm going to just jump in. I don't wear this particular coat. So I'm even playing field, and that's the key right there. I'm on the same playing field with the staff. I'm having laughter. I'm building confidence. I'm building morale. Plus, I'm building skills. So, you know, when, when you're capable, with your staff, they want to do this. You need to challenge them. You need to empower them because they want to do this. Some of the barriers that we face is with the, the food service directors, the, the registered dietitians, uh, is that they're so busy that they don't always get involved with the, the production aspect of things and the execution. They look at numbers. They look at, I got to go to this meeting. I got to go to this. But when you look at the individuals in that kitchen, they all have skills. If we bring out the skills and the empowerment of those folks, you're going to have a happier kitchen. And then what you do is you bring that individual out to your neighborhoods and say, I made this. Alice made this today. She made the best soup ever. Let the residents tell her that. You know, because that empowerment is going to make that kitchen happier and more productive. Now you're talking about food. And whenever you talk about food within that kitchen, now you're creating flavors and techniques and building morale. So, you know, I got tons of stories. I was at Panera Bread. This gentleman was 90 years old, and I had this particular coat on. And he was mid-afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he tugs on my shirt. Didn't know him from nowhere. Just tugs, you know, just yanks at me. What do you do? I said, I work with senior living. You mean old people like me? I said, well, you're not really that old. You're driving here. You're having a cup of coffee, reading the newspaper, and having a pastry. So if you look at Panera Bread, and I don't, I'm not you know, selling Panera Bread at all, but what I am selling is that people want that fresh cup of coffee. They want a nice pastry mid-afternoon. They don't want to be told when they have it. They want that ability to have choice and have a conversation. So you look at some of the programs out there, say in a proof and bake, uh, Danish's croissants or whatever. And the way they do it, you notice how shiny their case is? And the gentleman here who's the chef can attest to it. What they do is they glaze things with the apricot glaze or a simple syrup. It preserves the Danish. It makes a great shine within their showcase, right? You know, I was trained old school, French culinary, all kinds of stuff. So when we built a bakery case, we glazed everything so it's crispy, crunchy, flavorful, buttery, all kinds of things. So, <clears throat> so part of the challenges today is having your department that loves food. When I talk about loving food, you know, it doesn't matter if I work two hours or 15 hours in a day, as long as I get the right results of that flavor. And, you know, I won't go back in history. I don't, I don't count the hours in a day. But what we do is we create a job. And it shouldn't be just a job because it's the love of food. And when you talk about breaking bread with people, that's what the residents want to do. They want to share stories. And if you make that relationship with the residents, they're going to share stories how I made meatloaf, how I made stuffed peppers, how I cooked zucchini. You know, they grew things in gardens, and they ate 99% of their products. So part of my history is I used to, when I was a culinary director, I used to cook with the residents as an activity. I did 99% of the work. That was OK. But the stories and the relationships, what you built, even making homemade ice cream with them, or canning, when somebody told me a wild story, they canned a whole chicken one time. 
you know, they didn't have ice ba boxes back then. And that's the term what she used. We didn't have ice box. We had to do something. So all these different things, all the things we can learn from our residents to transfer into our own kitchens is huge. And whether you use that Hilda's name or you know Ben's name or whoever, if you identify with that individual, you're going to create that relationship base, and then bring in the kitchen out to those folks and saying, "Gee, they made the great soup, they made the great meatloaf, they made the great meatballs." I had a lady at one of the locations. She was 102. We served fresh corn on the cob. She didn't eat just one. She didn't eat two but she ate three ears of corn, and so she couldn't see well. She used the, her finger to put the butter on top. She was just in heaven. Those kind of stories you can't take away because that was a joy when she could eat that corn. She, didn't, she ate the whole thing, full ears of corn. She could feel the, and taste the freshness. And so when we think about, ah, oh, they can have a canned vegetable, they can have the fresh frozen. It's not the same. Today's market, whether you order from Cisco, US Foods, Martin Brothers, I don't care. They all have the ability to get you fresh cut vegetables that you can easily steam, easy, easy to roast or saute. So all the nutrients, all the flavors are right there. So when you talk about you have allergies, you don't have to put all this different seasonings on, you got freshness. It's all about the fresh. So sometimes I get on my high horse about fresh, 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 but we, have you ever opened a can of green beans or a can of asparagus? It's horrible. I mean, you're tasting army green. I don't even know what that flavor tastes like, but it's not good. So when you, yes. So where I challenge you is you don't have to have the canned green beans because it's full of sodium. Take that fresh green bean and bring it to a different level because what you do is it's still healthier. You open that can of green beans, guarantee that can of green beans is going to be 450 milligrams of sodium. And I, I know dietitians within this group, so now you add 450 to a, a quarter cup of, that's huge. So now you've got to balance out to be a, a two gram, how do you do that? If you've used up 90% of your sodium within one meal, it's tough. But I understand what you're saying, they want it tender. They, want, they don't want the crunch. But our new residents coming up through the years are going to. So what we need to do is teach our staff that this is the new generation coming through. We may be serving the current generation now, but what we have to do is be able to transform our staff into knowing, okay, our new residents are going to want this, but currently we bring in the fresh that has less sodium on it, so we're doing the good of the people now, not the good of, gee, it's convenience. Say so, Mm-hmm. Yep, and, and I've worked big places where we're serving, you know, 20,000 meals a month or 15,000 or 30,000. So the way to answer your question, it's, you know, you do some batch cooking. You, depending if you're serving out of a steam table or you're serving off the line, it really depends on how you're going to execute. Execution is really the key to a lot of different things. So within your batch cooking, maybe some of the equipment, what you have on your, steam, on your line is a batch cooking steamer where you're doing one pan at a time. Or, you know, if you got neighborhoods, now you're gonna have some different elements there as well. But to be able to serve a fresh, you know, 
you know, crunchy, it, it's a tough one. But it can be done, but to serve the um, really soft. Yep. Uh huh. So you're not going to win it. I, I mean, I think Patrick's answer is absolutely right. It's the batch cooking, and you got one batch of overcooked mushy southern green beans full of bacon and fat, and the other one is crispy and crunchy. So, you know, I, I, we're not going to we're not going to be able to meet both the aging generation, the aging out generation, and the aging in generation probably with the same. So, have two options. Mama Mia's green beans and fresh from the garden green beans and just get over it and serve them both. Because if, it, if we have to cater to everybody at the lowest common denominator, we're going to be excluding more and more people, I think, mm -hmm. at the top. We're getting close to running out of time. Oh. You got other strong points you want to make there? He, Patrick has talking points. <laughs> you know, the, a lot of... his mic away <laughs> A lot of them that we've already covered, you know, and I talked about the barriers and, you know, building that team. Um, uh, the manage, you know, when you hire within um, your structure, I always look, when I had to do hiring for my individual properties, I always looked for that individual that was a food background, whether they're a CDM or, you know, a culinary person, so that you're driving home that food to the, to the residents. Um, I feel that's a really important qualif qualifications of that individual or that position. Um, you know, um, you know I, like I said, I, I think we covered a lot of different talking points. And I know Linda wants to open it up for questions, so I'll let Linda take it. So um, I want to, did you hear the word he used? I love his word, table touching. Is that a chef word? Is that a, a do they use that word at Disney? I've never heard anybody but Patrick use that word. I love that word. So think about that, table touching in, in the bigger picture of dining and relationship. Whether it be the grandma who's cooking in the kitchen and has been there for 20 years and she comes out of the kitchen after the meal and touches the tables and touches the residents. And it's been fun for me to watch our, through our, our grant that the dining leaders in the organization set Patrick up when he comes on their site to touch the table of the pickiest, most complainy ladies who are generally on the food committee of the resident council. And Patrick goes and touches their table and schmoozes them up, but it's all about that relationship. And then at the same time, he pours them another cup of coffee, so much for the hydration program. He offers them seconds of anything that's a clean plate, so much for supplements, and it's all good. It just comes together with that table touching in relationship. And that's something that that your folks can do. So we've we've talked about chefs and the art of food and you know you just you think of food differently from how I think of food as a dietitian and a mother. Um, but it all comes together in that relationship at the end. So real quickly, I just want you to take a look at page seven and please read it as a homework assignment. It's a um, kind of a summary of the things that we've talked about today and offers them some suggestions to you of what to look for in your dining rooms. And again, if you look for it and you don't see it, then that can become part of your action plan to move your organization forward toward resident-directed dining. And the last thing I wanted to just mention before I turn it over to Brandon to talk about some challenges and some successes um, and then to open it to questions is that this is not about dietary departments. This is not about dietary and nursing departments. To pull this off in actuality successfully requires the 
community building of everyone in your organization coming together in some way in a team to support resident directed dining at home. So page number eight just gives you some hints about how to get some of the more reticent people to the table to help with that dining uh, experience and that all hands on deck kind of approach. So Brandon, I want, let's talk about some of the challenges and some of the successes that we've had. Thank you, um, both Linda and Patrick. I, I really appreciate, have appreciated the opportunity the last nine months to be working with them. I think you can tell from where our organization is, has been at, uh, we're still probably more towards that traditional model than towards that household or that neighborhood model, and we're really moving towards that person-centered care. I think the important thing about where we're at and a place for you to reflect on your journey through this process is how do you really move it towards that relationship-based aspect of how we how we provide that uh, meal and and work through that meal time. So, I think that's really kind of um, what I think has really driven us to work towards um, this effort with having Patrick focusing on what happens on the kitchen side, but also bringing that relationship for those people that have kind of been anonymous in the past cooking that meal and um, it, it seems like when the residents understand who that person is, know who that person is, it really makes a difference in how um, they perceive that meal and offer the suggestions, the complaints, the compliments. They're, they're more free to do that when they can put a, put a face to those people that are, that are actually doing that work. And I've really appreciated the work that uh, Linda and Action Pact has brought to our organization, uh, not just the facility that I'm at, but um, Centric Care as a whole. Uh, it really has uh, provided a foundational base for us as, as we move forward in this um, person-centered care model. We're all uh, very traditional in terms of our physical plants. So we start talking about some of the challenges. How do you work through that? And I truly believe that if you don't have the uh, person-centered care concepts, the, the household mindset uh, or neighborhood mindset with regard to what you're doing, it's really challenging when you get that opportunity for a new facility to execute it and make it work well. So I think you know, we have to look at those challenges as also being opportunities for us and how we overcome some of that. So um, with that, I think we'll open it up to any questions that people might have. With regard to our facilities, each of them are at a different place in their ability to do that. Um, we have one facility that has individual kitchens in each of their neighborhoods already. Uh, my facility, for example, we have a small activity kitchen. So it's a matter of looking at that resource that you have available and where can you do that? Is it baking the bread? Is it making the dessert that's gonna be served at the supper time in that group of residents that's uh, involved with that, participating in that, that is actually having a hand in how that, how that happens. But taking the opportunity to, to do that, whether it's with um, nutrition services staff or activity staff or other staff that just have a passion uh, for working with that. One of the principles that we've tried to incorporate in our, in our programs across Center Care that Action Pack really works towards is kind of that 80-20 um, rule where if you have something that you feel passionate about, whether it's music, whether it's cooking, um, taking those gifts that you have, if I'm a nursing assistant and I really enjoy cooking, taking some of that time and moving away from what my traditional role is in, and um, maybe assisting with that baking activity or, or bringing my guitar in and you know spend, spending some time and just really working on uh, encouraging our staff to be part of that relationship part. So I just find in too, just to remember, not so much on the guitar side, but on the dining side, as you look to involve staff from other departments, be really, really careful to make sure they're properly trained, especially in sanitation and safety. Um, we've used the, the serve safe, not the certification level for everybody, but the employee book level, because we don't, the guitar is cool. If you can play it, you can sing, and you're not gonna make anybody sick from it. But as we look to involve our staff that aren't trained in sanitation and safety, particularly to make sure that we do a little mini training course for people. 
some of my best results is when I've worked with the, uh, the residents as an activity. You know, uh, whether it's an apple pie, we may make two apple pies within the group. Behind the scenes, we made a lot of apple pies. It was served. So in there, you know, we made the apple pies and we grew, blah, blah, blah. Then, you know, to be able to say we served all the apple pies for us to preserve. That way, just to Linda's point, is it safe, safe environment? But at the same time, we illustrated that we made apple pies and they, they enjoy doing that. And we don't want to take that joy away from them. So it's all about the joy of food. And they've cooked all their lives. So they want to participate. They want to give you feedback. Yep, this was great. Or you know what? It didn't taste however they You got too much cinnamon in it, Patrick. <laughs> so it all goes back to where we started with that concept of what does your resident want? How did they do it at home? And how can we come as close to that, doing it in our environments together? So we're all available after, I think our time is up. I saw a five minute sign. I bet you've got a two minute sign over there too. Do we have a code for the session? Got it. So thank you all very, very much for spending time with us. And please come up and share and we'll, we'll stay as long as you want. Um, thanks again. <laughs>